name is Richard Kagoe, and I just want to dispel two rumors. I'm not related to the deputy president, <laughs> though we share a lot in terms of uh, resemblance and affinity. And there's been a video that has been doing a lot of circulation on social media of a guy laughing at uh, a Maasai Moran who came back from the U.S. with an American accent. I don't know whether you've seen that on circulation, right? It's a friend of mine, he's called a black guy, and he's a creatives guy. So this one day we had a very interesting discussion in studio. We had uh, Miss Mandy, the radio presenter, and a gentleman called Eric Omondi. He used to be Eric Omondi, the comedian uh, personal manager. And uh, they had a very interesting conversation in studio. So me, um, you know, the all put up guy together, and I had a co-anchor, and they had an interesting discussion. So in the process, when they're tossing it back to me, I had guys on the gallery. Those are the guys you never see. Those are the guys in the control room. A very humorous discussion. So they would laugh at me on the other side when I'm supposed to be doing the news presentation. So I burst out into heartily laughter. I couldn't read the stories which were lined up next. So a guy of mine, Black, picked up the whole you know, video clip and uh, inserted the Maasai Moran, who came back from the U.S., who got that deep American accent, and put it together. So everyone else has always thought that uh, I was, in a way, demeaning that Maasai Moran. That's not the story. <laughs> anyway, um, I just want to start off by sharing using this example, very briefly. Uh, in 2012, that's about uh, four years ago, I'd just been married for about a year, and uh, my wife works at Kenya Airways. So she's in the customer service. I know she's been receiving a lot of bashing from people around here. But uh, something was happening in the organization. They're about to undertake a staff rationalization program. They're just another way of saying retrenchment. And uh, she had a colleague, I'll call her Rose, and Rose was very enterprising. This is what she did. When they got off, uh, you know, starting the job in 2006, uh, Rose got a job as a cabin crew. So she was really excited. It was something new in her life. So she decided this is going to be my life, you know, traveling to Hong Kong, London, Paris, Dakar, name all those destinations, 52 plus destinations then. It was something new for her. Talk about novelty. She was really excited about it. Then two, three years down the road, she decided to settle down and to start off a family. So the job was becoming a bit of a burden to her because when you're out station, you spend an average of about, I think, two nights or one night or so. So she has children, like two of them. So you're having competing needs here. So you have a very demanding job, and also you need to strike a balance with your family. So the job lost the excitement. She was not actually very driven to perform the task. She's just going through the norms every day, you know, serving, you know, the clients on board. And at one point, she discovered that uh, she was doing something interesting, something that was giving her some sense of fulfillment. So she used to organize birthday parties and do them, and do them very well. So someone challenged her to monetize the newfound passion. And so she enlisted for, I think, an event certification course, which she did. And that graduated from a birthday party, graduation party, to starting even doing weddings. So the job became a bit of an inconvenience to her. And so now she's making an extra income, trying to balance with the work. It was becoming difficult. And so she, she couldn't just quit immediately. So when the company announced in 2012 that they were retrenching, there was an option of you sitting back and waiting to know your fate, and there was another provision for you to do early retirement. She was the second employee to submit her early voluntary retirement request. So I asked her, what's informing that decision? She said she was doing that simply because the money that she's going to be getting in terms of compensation will become seed capital. Today, as we speak, she's got, you know, I mean, looking at her client portfolio, 
she's servicing big corporates. Uh, she's employed about uh, 15 people directly. And beyond that, she looks back and says, 2012 was the best thing that ever happened to her. Now you compare that scenario and other members of staff who are declared redundant. And actually that rang a bell. And I told myself, I think the days of working until retirement, age of 55, 54, those days are long gone. And I've been working in the media now into 12 years. I've been with my employer for close to about nine years now. September next year, I'm going to be doing 10 years. In fact, somebody just met me yesterday and told me, those guys should just give you shareholding now. <laughs> I mean, surely 10 years is a long time. But it's been a learning curve for me. So in the process, for about five years, I was hosting a business program called Pay Setters. So every week, I'd pick out on an entrepreneur or a corporate leader, and I just want to share their story. And I was able to sustain because the availability of content in this town is so much. But the stories that really struck me the most was not Isaac Awond of CBA. It was not Bob Collim of Safaricom. It's not Rita Kavashe of GM East Africa. It's the stories of people like Hajj Motors, Mark Okumu, who quit a plum job at uh, that Baptist retreat center in Limuru, Brackenast, to start off a garage along Kijabe Street. And today, in 2012, as we're speaking, his average income in a month, which he could disclose conservatively, was 10 million shillings. From a job where you used to earn roughly about 18,000 in 1998. Those are the stories that generated the most in terms of response. In terms of feedback, those were amazing stories, fascinating people. And I was very privileged to meet all these kind of people. But then some guy challenged me and told me, he's just a, an ordinary guy, everyday person. No offense to people in cash in transit business, eh? So, one day I met a guy that I interviewed. He's called Narendra Raval. I think, Washek, you need to call that guy for a discussion here. He's got an amazing story. Most of us don't know him. Uh, he's the chairman and founder of a company called Dev Devki Group. So, they're in cement. They are in uh, Mabati. I think, uh, what else? They do steel. And he just came from talking to KU students about entrepreneurship. And he challenged me and asked me, so... What do you want to do for the rest of your life? Do you just want to be coming and reading news? You'll be old. You'll need to strike a balance with your family. I mean, at one point, you need to exit. So he was telling me, start even something as small as an M-Pesa shop. At least you'll have an extra income. So it's a decision I postponed for close to about three years. So last year, 2015 starting, I'm turning 35 this year. And I told myself, 2016 November, you're approaching the halftime of your life. It's not about chasing success. It's about chasing significance. What is it that I can do for the remainder part of my life so that I can make a difference in the lives of people around me? Washek well, has been challenging us. Just look within and see if uh, you have a talent, something that you feel irritates you the most, and probably then that's how you can discover your newfound passion and perhaps your purpose for life. I thank God for the 10 plus years I've been in media. It's been an amazing challenge for me. It's really brought out the best in me. And in the process, I've been able to bring out the best in other people's lives. So I said, you know what? I'm passionate about entrepreneurship, communication consultancy, based on some of the projects that I'd handled you know, previously, but I'd never thought I could monetize that and make that into a business. So 2015, starting January, I told myself the first quarter, Every week, I'm giving myself a challenge. I have to meet a CEO every week. So that I did without fail for three months, probably chasing for job prospects. But I never got a single positive reply. But I realized in life early, just like as a salesperson, you must get yourself accustomed to getting piles of rejection before you get that yes. And I have an incredible mother. 
an incredible mother. I celebrate her. And I celebrate all the women here. Because this is what my mom used to do to us early in life. She would challenge you every week, not every week, every day. We used to call it the failure sessions. She would ask you, what have you tried today? By the time you're failing, you know what that does to you? I'd go, get rejected, get a regret. It leaves me a better person in terms of confidence. I learn better how not to approach it next time. So I'd challenge all of us, yeah? There's something about failure. Just try it. Every day, challenge yourself. And that's what actually St. Tony Entrepreneur did to me. There's a topic about courage. List the things that you feel you dread the most. Sociologists say that uh, do what you fear the most and fear will disappear. Right? So that's what I challenged myself. So I remember one engagement I had with a prospective client on my way out. He told me, by the way, it's been a moment since we last had an engagement with a communications expert. It's been two years. Luckily, I printed my business card. So it was still, uh, what do you call them, briefcase company. But I just submitted it and I told him, you know what? That's basically what I do. A month later, he gave me a contract for three months to do communications consultancy. What happened and what really struck me the most was this. He was paying me two times what my employer pays me. So I said, you know what? I've never done this before, but I console myself telling myself this. There's always a first time in life. So I delivered my first assignment three months. Excited, he gave me another contract renewal for three months. So in the process, I was learning a lot. There was so much money that was coming. 2015, towards the end, I managed to bug like three, four other contracts in the process. But in terms of personal finance management, managing your cash flow, it was an issue. So I'd get the cash, personal consumption. I was not investing in the business itself. I mean, you look at my bank statement, there's a stark difference between 2015 and the years past. It's like night and day, perfect strangers. I mean, money is flowing, but I have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. So that's when Stanley, who's one of the facilitators, had dropped by our studio in December to talk about personal finance management and what you can do so that you can avoid January blues. It was just about December. And I tell you, Asheke, uh, Stanley is very interesting. He's very intelligent. He was supposed to just talk about personal finance, but he was able to toss in about entrepreneurship. When he finished the interview, because I was not the one who was doing the interview, I told him, you're not going anywhere. We sit. We need to have a discussion. It's well past 10 o'clock. St. Entrepreneurship is there. He's telling me it's starting on January, I think, 20th or something. So I tell him, sir, sir, I'll be there. I made a commitment. First, it was a mind shift. I told myself 49000 is not an expense to me. For me, it's an investment. Very incredible lessons I have learned. My most favorite was on taxation. So I've been receiving money. Some of my clients are KRA agents. <laughs> All right. So 5%, they retain it. The rest, I wasn't remitting. So we had a very interesting facilitator. I, I tell you, taxation was the best for our class. Started from 9, I left at 2.30, guys were still stuck in class. It's very difficult. I mean, it's technical, too hard to understand, and what a view. But this is how this guy approached taxation. He told us, if you want to understand taxation, buy ice cream, chew 30% of it. That's just a total description of what taxation is all about. So there are guys right now, you've gone pitch for a business, and a client is telling you, produce an ITAX certificate of compliance. Most of us don't have. By the time you realize you have a backlog, you're accruing interest. That was a major, major thing that I took out from that class. In terms of opportunity citing, it was something else. My perception nowadays is totally different. I'm increasingly conscious of my environment. I'm very curious. I ask questions. I look out for opportunities wherever they exist. I'm that kind of a person. You look at a tree, me, I see furniture. <laughs> yeah, you look at just an orange, me, I see a forest, the potential in there. 
it changed my mindset. I don't just walk around, laze around like everyone else. There's something else also that I picked out from that. You see, most of us, we're getting into business and we're trying to do what everyone else is doing. There's that business about when guys were doing those small bars. I can't remember what they were called. Quails, right? So everyone else is in quails. But you see, first, when you've identified your passion, you've identified the need that you're meeting, there's also importance of specialization and, you know, deciding what your niche market would be. For me, I realized the biggest opportunity that existed in my field was small and medium-sized enterprises. They just didn't have people who could connect them and do a proper strategic communications job for them. That I was able to define when you were taken through a class on strategy. That was big for me. That was really big for me. Another thing was on legal business. I remember I once administered a project for somebody, but our engagement was just a verbal agreement. After I did the job, the guy just came and told me, you know what, I was not pleased with the outcome of the job that you executed. It was a verbal agreement, there was no contract signed, I can't take this guy to court. There's an aspect of legal business that you cover in this particular class. Structuring of business and defining roles. My office is a, I have three bedrooms, so I just decided to use one of them, which I set up. Right now, that's where, from where I work from. I have the internet. Uh, if, in terms of equipment, I outsource because I'm still developing capacity for myself. So I'm not going to hire a very posh you know, office and yet I don't have the business that can sustain that. So we learned about progression and how you can be able to develop your business over time. Then, lastly, what I just want to share is this. Transition from employment to starting a business. That's also very critical. This is an aspect that will be covered in this uh, Centonomy Entrepreneurship class. I mean, there's so much that I can share. But I can say this, I don't regret the investment that I made, and I'm not standing here because I've been coached or to vouch for Centonomy Entrepreneurship, but for me, it's an experience that I would recommend to everyone. I mean, I can't just explain it to you. You have to be there to experience it yourself. And I would say this, the level of confidence, the courage that I've developed over time, it has really set me free because... I'm not threatened by anyone. I have a fallback plan, and that has really give me, given me a sense of, uh, you know, comfort and liberation. And I feel like I'm well on track in realizing my full potential. So I would recommend, I was like everyone else from 2013 postponing. And you see, when I was postponing initially, class was about 10, 15 thou. Now it's coming to about 35K. So postpone one session, and you'll pay better future, right? So make a point, and I will say this eh, as I close. I close many times. Eh? <laughs> Dr. Wale Akinyemi said something. I think for me that was an aha moment as far as entrepreneurship is concerned. You're saying, imagine you are outside social security house, right? Maybe say the 20th floor. And someone tells you, you jump onto Bishop's Road down, down there. I mean, you won't make that move simply because you're trying to reason. And maybe you're looking for, not unless you have a parachute, maybe you have a ladder, something that can take you down there. But if you're told there's a bomb that has been planted in this building, and it's going to detonate in the next uh, 30 seconds, reflex action, and you're down there. Don't wait for circumstances to push you to make that decision to the next level. Do it when you can. Don't wait for circumstances. I'm glad I made that decision, and I know what I know now, and I would urge you, make that point. Make that move. They say if you don't take chances, you'll never make advances. Thank you.